Bernard Lederer has us hooked with our new central impulse chronometer Inverto, Corum impresses yet again with her Cortina Admiral, IWC teams up with Warner Brothers and two Aquaman themed releases, and we visit Moser. All this and more on today's show. Welcome to the Scottish Watches podcast. It's the Christmas Dave edition. Christmas Dave. Look, Christmas Dave's in the spirit. We're looking a bit twinny, although we've got the whole blue and white thing going on, but you know what Dave is saying. Did we just Christmas. become best friends? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's Christmas Day. Bolton if holes, I'm gonna, Bolton if I, holes. <laughs> if I'm going to do, bro code, if I'm going to do Christmas, I do Christmas Day. That's about it. But we're going to do it anyway. And you know, shout out to Edward and the crew because you know, Moser and Co. So indeed, welcome to the Scottish Watches podcast. We are in the festive spirits. This episode will be dropping on Christmas Day. If you're listening to us on Christmas Day, if you're watching us on Christmas Day or shortly thereafter, then welcome. Hope you're having a great time with your loved ones, if you actually have any. I don't know if me and Dave do, but, you know, fingers crossed. We'll see what happens. Uh, play along at home, check the show notes, click the link in your podcast player. That will take you to our website, a page designated for this episode of the show. You'll find all the pictures, the links, the tech spec, all that good stuff in there. And if you're joining us in the viewing medium on YouTube, we'd appreciate if you subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell so you're updated when new editions drop. And if you like what you see, drop us a comment and a like. Let us know your thoughts positive and negative and Dave always likes it when the tests come back negative so we probably crack on with things and a brand that I've heard of I was supposed to have a meeting with him at Geneva Watch Days this year but I missed the appointment somehow I can't remember how that happened but it's a real shame because I'm now looking at the pictures of the releases that they've had especially this new one not that we would have seen this across there But this looks incredible from a brand that perhaps not many people have heard of, Dave. Indeed. And what are we talking about here? We're talking about the Bernard Lederer Central Impulse Chronometer Inverto. Now that is a mouthful. This is part of their, what is known as, in shorthand, the CIC range, which is this Central Impulse Chronometer. A super cool looking watch. They've done some limited edition variants of it in the past. I believe a couple in white gold, a rose gold and a steel. And they did have a very multicoloured variant that was waiting for its moment in the sunshine, which was meant to be at the Only Watch auction. But as we all know, that auction did not go ahead for a multitude of reasons. But he has only leaked some pictures of a new version. It's going to be limited edition again, but it's not available quite yet but there's going to be more details coming in the near future about it but what he's done here is he's effectively taken the dial away and he's done the thing that many people have thought twice about which is turn the movement upside down how many times have you looked through that beautiful display case back and thought i should wear the watch the wrong way around because it's prettier at the back than it is at the front and he's actually done it he's inverted the movement hence the name and everything that you wish to see that's usually against your wrist is on full view to the world so yeah this is a super super cool looking watch some details about it As mentioned, this limited edition release is based on the edition that was originally for the only watch with the upside down movement in there. You've got a very symmetrical looking movement where everything is as you would like it to be. If you have OCD and you don't like things not being quite centralised or mirrored or equaled, then this is probably the watch for you because there's a beautiful symmetry to what is on display straight in front of you every time you look at your wrist on this one. Price point is not going to be particularly wallet friendly, that said. Maybe wrist friendly, definitely not wallet friendly. Coming in at 150,000 of your Swiss francs. So definitely not a pocket money watch by any accounts. Everything about it though, you've got this dark grey PVD coated case. Some folk aren't going to like that on a watch at this price point, but I'm sure they've done their research and know that it's going to last the test of time. Hopefully anyway, coming in at 44mm by around 12mm, just under 12mm thick. So it's going to have certainly a bit of wrist presence about it. You've got the remontoirs in there. If no one knows what remontoirs up, check the show notes out and let's see if Miziel's done his homework and actually gets the facts right. How about you tell the listeners they don't have to f*** off to the show notes, Dave? Well, I'll tell them, but I also want to know if Miziel can spell remontoir correctly. I can't even say it correctly, never mind spell it. Let's see if uh, Miziel can spell Remontoir correctly, as opposed to me mispronouncing it incorrectly. Anyway, what is it? It's a little spring that helps to balance out the power delivery into the gear train, and it is powered from the mainspring. So the mainspring transfers some power to this spring, which then helps to effectively, for want of a better phrase, dampen out the power transfer into the watch, which in theory allows for a smoother transfer of power into all of that gear train which 
ends up with being more accurate, more precise and a better time teller all in all. Quite a rare complication in the grand scheme of things as it is a grand complication because it's quite difficult to make it has to be said but he has done a fantastic job of this. I love it. I'm not usually a fan of skeleton dials and dials are cut out and all a bit together missing parts but this one for me is a bit of a hit albeit at 150,000 a considered hit for me. When I first saw the press release for this and had looked through the details the pictures reminded me of a collaboration perhaps between Armin Strom and a brand we're going to talk about slightly later on because the watch they've got out just now looks a little bit like this and that's Corum. The colours are great with the normal one the black and the gold goes very well together and the layout is very reminiscent of perhaps some of the Arnold and Sons, MBNF, and most definitely Armin Strom, especially the ones we saw this year. They also do a colour version that looks like the Electricians or Louis Erard. You've got all these different weird and wonderful sort of funhouse colours mixed together on the dial, and the way that the sapphire comes to the edge, almost bezel-less. I think it's fantastic looking. Price point wise, yeah, it's a bit punchy, but then again, when you get up to this level, you're going to be paying a premium for getting something like this on the wrist. I'd love to actually see this in real life, and we forget the opportunity, and they have not fallen out with us. Next year at Watches and Wonders, perhaps if they're in the smaller area, the where all the independents are, or if they're coming back to Geneva watch days, or other events that we'll be going to across the year, it'd be nice to check them out and learn a little bit more about the brand because it's a name, as I say, I've heard, I've read, I've seen, but I've not really done too much research on them. I definitely, as I've mentioned, very much like the look of this. There's only 18 pieces of it though, so I believe it's gone on sale stroke availability for pre-order as of when we're speaking. So whether those 18 will last very long, that's a very different question. As I said, 150 is a huge amount of money, but it's also not in the absolute fantasy leagues of watches. And as we all know, that can move up considerably higher than 150. But for what you're getting for the money, a whole lot of watch for a whole lot of money, it has to be said. But yeah, I like the look of this. Really would love to see one in the hand. But with there only being 18 of them, the chances are probably rather slim. Yes, and the chances of me and Dave being rather slim after being festively plump this year very very small but we should probably find out what me and Dave have been up to over the past few weeks because since we got back from Dubai it has just been an avalanche of catching up with things catching up with people email recording shows recording videos lots of interviews and getting things kind of stacked up like the squirrel with the nuts before hibernation so we've got all the content ready for the end of the year but we're taking it a little bit easy but Mizzy on the team are still drip feeding all the stuff out there so Dave What's been happening with you? What's been happening? So I am finally back in the uh, den of iniquity that is my residence in Scotland. And that is because I've spent the last best part of three weeks on remand in Switzerland and have finally been given festive release. So I'm allowed out for the holiday season. That word remand, Dave, that reminds me of a conversation that I screenshotted maybe a year and a half ago, perhaps even longer, where I was speaking to someone and casually asking about uh, somebody in their past <laughs> to be told that they were on remand. It was an interesting story. Do you remember that story, Dave? That was in a previous life, Ricky, in a life that you're no longer allowed to partake in or be involved in in any way as you're a happily attached individual. But yes, I, I very much remember that conversation and it was very humorous. It was what's called a close escape. It was a close escape of the third kind. Luckily, the individual concerned... I believe is either still on remand or incarcerated. Therefore, your escape is fortuitous, unlike if his is, where it may not be so fortuitous for you. Correct. This is back in the days of Tinder Ricky, which are long gone, as everybody now knows. But I will put this screen capture in the show notes as a little Christmas gift if someone wants to read something that is entirely hilarious. I think there will be a degree of redaction with names etc on there for the safety of everybody concerned but yes I'm sure it will make a few people giggle. Ricky what have you been up to? Oh well I have been busy as I mentioned at the start of the show recording things, getting the advent calibre sorted out, turns out recording 24 videos, scripting 24 videos and creating uh, all the stuff that goes around 24 videos takes a bit of time Who'd have thunk it, eh? But uh, it's finally done. It is out there. All the episodes should be, or most definitely are, 
online on our Instagram as Reels and on YouTube as Shorts. And it's basically a walk down memory lane over the past year or thereabouts of watches that have been sent in for review from different brands. So back a few months ago, when we were in Geneva at Geneva Watch Days, we got to see all the brands that were part of that show. And there were always a couple of brands that do a little bit of something on the side in a different area. And one of those brands was Corum. And we went up to a exhibition area that Corum had taken over for the period of Geneva Watch Days. And we got to sit down and in previous episodes, check out the show notes for more details on those episodes. We got to see a few of their new wares and their project development watches. I think they had a kind of prototype come concept watch that we had to look at. And I think all of us that saw it, both you, Ricky, myself and Simona, were rather taken by this concept. Very, very cool looking thing. But we also got to see some of their more usual models within the range. Part of that being the Admiral series. I think we, well, particularly you, were taken by the graffiti styled ones that had the kind of luminous graffiti style graphics on it as well. But they've got a new model out, this being a collab between a brand Cortina. So this is a Corum X Cortina Admiral 42 Automatic Black and Gold. Now, when people say Cortina to me, I remember my dad talking about old Ford cars from the 70s and 80s that were a little bit shit unless Lotus were involved. Yep. Uh, funnily enough, the minute I read this, I thought, ah, the old Cortinas. My, I remember my grandfather had a Cortina and it was brown. And I'm pretty sure it had a vinyl roof. It was truly horrific. The seats were like bench wood. Sounds like your wardrobe. My, a magical mystery wardrobe. You know, there's another Christmas film. What's in the back of the wardrobe? Anyway, back to this watch. Now, the Admiral is, I think it's fair to say, a love it or hate it aesthetic. It's got quite a strong identity to it. Personally, I'm a bit of a fan of it. I know Ricky's definitely a fan of the white ceramic versions we've seen of it. But this one is a black ceramic version with a bezel where they've done something quite interesting. First time I saw the picture, I thought to myself, this reminds me of something that's been done and who's it been done by? And it came to me, it was some of the cases that Gerard Perigo have done in the Absolute Laureatos. Now, this is similar aesthetically, but it's different where they have mixed 18 karat gold in with the ceramic mix and used that to make the bezel, which results in a bezel that's got this kind of gold flecked appearance through it as well. And I think it is a particularly good looking aesthetic, like the watch we were talking about back at the start of this episode. Very much a black and gold aesthetic going on here. I think it's a little bit like when you buy a car and you suddenly see that car everywhere, but beforehand you never really paid attention, so you never noticed it. And Corum has popped up consistently in different news feeds and our emails with chats with people across the world. And a year ago, I didn't really care for them. I didn't pay much attention. Yeah, I'd done some bits and bobs with Pietro Limited Edition, the Corum bubble and a few things like that. But they're more and more on my radar. And this is stunning. The bezel, like you mentioned, is just brilliant looking. And it reminds me of a Duke watch that we saw over at Dubai, but even better. And as you say, it's got a marbling fleck effect there that wouldn't look out of place on a desktop counter or in a stately home or somewhere like that. And being a collaborative watch, I think they've done quite a few of these in the past. It's to celebrate 50 years of Cortina and it's definitely not the car we're talking about this time. I really like it. I'm hoping to convince the guys from Quorum to come on and talk about the brand because when we got that presentation last year, it was epic just learning about what they've done, their history, and the fact that they've got so many cool things. And they started so many cool things back in the day. So yeah, this is a great looking watch. And the price point is not too bad either. Well, yes and no, I guess. Uh, I am conscious that I said it was gold mixed in with ceramic for the bezel. I misspoke. It is carbon. The case is sandblasted ceramic, but the bezel is a carbon and gold layup, which gives this flecked effect. So apologies for my error earlier on. But yeah, price point wise, um, now I believe I've only seen the price for this in Singapore dollars, which is 38,000 Singapore dollars. It is a premium of around 10 or 11,000 Singapore dollars over a more regular ceramic version of the Admiral. So it seems not completely out of kilter with where it should be. I guess it depends how much of that 5N red gold is in that bezel. 
Outside of that, 50 metres water resistance, you've got 50 limited edition pieces of this that will be sold globally. It's going to be exclusively available via Cartina themselves and via their website, but I believe they will be able to sell this watch to you wherever you are in the world. Uh, outside of that, it is the in-house calibre based on an ETA movement. Nothing wrong with that very much a workhorse, does the job. Yeah, I think this is a cool, different looking watch. And if you're out there for something that's a little bit out of the normal, but it's got a bit of wrist presence, then Corum is potentially the brand for you. Definitely. And it turns out that Swatch Group have been in court battles yet again. It's not with small independent brands, perhaps like Vortic over in the States this time, but it turns out it's up against the might and the muscle of Samsung. And you are a Swatch Group kind of guy, you know what's happening, you have your finger on the pulse when it's not stuck in your rectum. So what's going on here, Dave? So this is a bit of an interesting one. This is much more, I guess, about IP and about rights than it is about something more watch specific. So smartwatches, they've proliferated through the world. Obviously, there's the Apple Watch out there. You've got the Samsung Samsung watches and a multitude of others out there as well. But Samsung have taken a different approach to Apple. Apple's kind of uh, garden for applications and apps is quite a ring fence kind of walled garden they've got. So they are very careful about what allows to be ended up on your watch. Whereas Samsung have taken a much more open house approach where developers are able to upload apps onto the watches in a much freer manner than let's say Apple. But all of these are generally made available through Samsung's own app store. And the problem is there's a few creative individuals who have decided to do digital copies of well-known watches, whether that be Speedmasters, Seamasters, various Longines, some Blancpons, various other watches out there. But they have effectively digitised these watch faces created an app that allows you to upload these onto your Samsung smartwatch and have a digital replication of a fancy mechanical wristwatch. Now, Swatch Group have taken exception to this and it does very much seem that there are a few brands that are being chosen for these digital versions. A lot of them are Swatch Group. I've also seen some from Rolex and a few other well-known brands, but Swatch Group have taken exception and decided to go to the High Court in the UK and take Samsung to task. On the basis that Samsung are the gatekeepers to this community, they tried to use the defence of it's third party people, it's nothing to do with us, we are merely the facilitator of the store that allows people to retail their gear, their wares to the world, but the court seemed to take a different view and have said that, uh, well, it's your store and you need to police the content that's on there, if the content on there is impinging on other people's rights, then that's a you problem, not a them problem. And they have won. That being Swatch Group have won and Samsung are now going to have to take some serious action in order to remove all of these apps that go against the rules. It will probably have much more far-reaching consequences, I would assume, because now that Swatch Group have won, other people who have their IP being infringed on the Samsung ecosphere are probably going to now jump on this opportunity knowing that one of the big boys has won a court case, so there is now precedent. So it appears that that's the end of your looky-likey digital Swatch Watch type thing going on. I can totally see why this has been done because companies need to protect their intellectual property and it seems to be the case, especially in the United States, perhaps in the UK and elsewhere, that if you do not protect what is yours, then it can lapse, it can fall into not the public domain, but almost public terminology. And if you don't defend something, you can lose the rights to it. So I understand why they've done this. It's a little bit like Rolex going after people that use the term oyster or jubilee. And if you've designed something, you don't want somebody kind of ripping it off and creating their own thing, either at a cost or free of charge. On the flip side, no one is going to look at an illuminated digital watch face and think it's a Speedmaster. That's not going to happen. So it's a, it's a half and half. I can understand why they did it. In a business world, they have to, but also no one is ever going to mistake it. And a mistake we nearly made was thinking that IWC were finished for the year. We thought they invited us over to do a factory tour to show us some stuff. And uh, that bit, you know, game's over, everyone goes on holiday, kumbaya. But it turns out they've got a couple of new releases that they sneaked out right at the end of December. This has dropped at the very last minute, just before Christmas. I guess ultimately when you find out what the watch is uh, styled around, probably to be 
based around the launch of the movie itself and this is two Aquaman themed Aqua Timers so there's a very aqua orientated lineup there now these are unusual for aqua timers aqua timer is the dive watch of the iwc range but they've done aqua timer perpetual calendar digitals as what they are being called so this is a bit of a monstrous watch in terms of complications and as you will find out later also slightly monstrous in terms of size so two new watches based around two watches that are used in the movie a glowing blue and a glowing red pro watch that are being used in the movie now i haven't seen the movie i haven't even looked at the trailers this sounds a little bit like the christopher nolan movie that came out during the pandemic called tenet and hamilton did this massive black and blue black and red digital styled watches as well and i believe the prop watches that were used in the movie again were very much digital props they weren't active real watches and yes they did release a greatly watered down version I think it would be fair to say that Hamilton released compared to it I think it would be unfair to call these watered down as the IWC perpetual calendar in itself is a bit of an engineering marvel so these are pretty complicated watches although not quite identical to what is being used in the, the, the you know the sci-fi movie so let's say it's sci-fi in the movie world and it's very much real perpetual calendars in the real world Is Amber Heard going to be in this movie? I have no idea because I have neither watched any trailer or anything about this movie it's not really my bag well Dave I didn't expect you to shit the bed when I asked you that question well you know these things happen so back to the watch case made out of serotonium keep your ears peeled because we will be having a episode in the near future with IWC talking about serotonium and materials in general so yep serotonium this wonder material that IWC put to market a few years ago a titanium based material that gives properties of ceramic and of titanium trying to get a bit of the best of both worlds and remove some of the negatives of both of the materials black finish case very much down to the reason that serotonium has a black finish when it's been done and dealt with as a case. So it's not a PVD coating, it's not a CVD coating, it is very much the colour of the material itself. And if you want to know more about the durability of that colour, keep your ears peeled again because we'll be talking about that very topic when we get into that episode. Kurt Klaus, the genius at IWC who was the person who kind of was the, I won't quite say inventor of the perpetual calendar, but he was the he was the designer of the IWC perpetual calendar modules. So yeah, all of that goodness baked into this watch as well. You've got the safe dive bezel system on there as well, a proprietary system to protect the bezel for inadvertent movements when you're diving. The only thing that caught my eye about this is it only has a hundred meters of water resistance but I guess being a perpetual calendar it's a dive watch in the loosest sense of the word dive watch outside of that though it is a rather gargantuan 49 millimeters in diameter so this is no small watch with a height of are you ready for it 19.5 millimeters so there is no two ways about it this is going to be seen on the wrist hopefully that darker case color will help to pull the size as far as your eyes are concerned back a little bit because at near 50 millimeters this ain't going to be sliding under the cuff of your shirt anytime soon other than that 25 pieces of each colorway so it's a super limited edition release this as well price point wise coming in at 62,000 euros which is around 57 and a half thousand us dollars probably not many are going to be seen in the wild certainly not with only 50 in existence but I think I really like the look of this, but I'm not so keen on the size. Well, I do like the look of it. I'm not keen on the price. How does that sound? I think it's good when watches tie in with movies a little bit more than just it's got something on the dial that's reminiscent of what perhaps one of the main characters were wearing. And I remember limited editions coming out, particularly in the Hamilton range, like Men in Black with the Ventura and various other things, Interstellar Watch, which eventually they released a version of the Murph thereafter. These ones, yeah, it ties in. It's just a little bit of a strange collab. It's a bit of a strange price point because usually these things are themed differently. And as much as being similar to props in the movie versus perhaps AP with Spider-Man and the Black Panther, which were a lot more expensive... 
I'm not sure how this one will sit, but they don't have that many to get rid of. I just thought it was rather strange and amusing that after us doing our tour of IWC, that we would come across two brand new watches that we didn't know anything about. But speaking of IWC, that leads on perfectly well to our continuation of our trip across to almost Germany. The Swiss border, Schaffhausen, and in the last episode we left you on the cliffhanger that was the train conductor trying to convince me that I should have brought my passport with me even though I was travelling within country. And as I said to Dave, after that German conductor left, didn't they learn the last two times? Yes, indeed. Uh, and I maybe suggested that that was a joke probably best kept until we got off the train, as opposed to being held on the train for not having the suitable papers. Oh, again, yes, they probably didn't learn the last time that that phrase was popular in the vernacular. But outside of that, indeed, we should have probably guessed that we got onto a German train at a Swiss station and had to leave Switzerland in order to re-enter Switzerland at the town of our destination. But needless to say, we did get there safely and off we got at Schaffhausen Station and uh, we were picked up very kindly by Nils from Moser who dropped us into his rather nice new car and drove us up to the Moser Museum. Now I don't think either of us expected fully what we were about to see here. I heard Moser Museum and I thought okay another museum to do with watches a bit like we've seen at IWC or Omega or many of the other brand museums a room full of lots of historical watches from that brand. But no, we went to the house that was the house built by Moser back in the day, I believe back in the 1860s, 1870s, somewhere around about there. That's probably not quite right, but it's definitely in and around the right area. And he built this house after he came back from his travels and had made himself some money and started to give back to the town of Schaffhausen. We walked in. And we saw the ground floor, which was vacant. They had some nice, cool mosaic styling on the floor, but the, there was nothing. It was just completely empty. And I looked around and thought, oh, what are we actually signed up for here? But it turned out, once we were taken up the stair, it was a completely different story. They were doing renovations down there. I've got no idea what was there before, or what they've got planned for it. But up the staircase, I was just blown away. I had an instant feeling of going to some of the places in Scotland, and I don't usually go to museums, but some of the places like Province Lordship, you enter, or even Glasgow Cathedral, there's a gravity from the area. And I don't know if it's the setting, what they've done, the way they've laid things out, as it would have been back hundreds of years ago, but I was just captivated. And I'm more into futuristic things rather than the past, so this kind of caught me a little bit strangely. But they had oval paintings in the wall, they had wall-mounted clocks from different manufacturers, and then the first room we walked into, and this will be a kind of guide quickly of what it was like at this museum, was on the left-hand side. And it was the equivalent of going back in time to a steampunk generation office where there was a desk, there were all kinds of things on. There was a lamp, there was a typewriter. In the corner, there was a camera on a tripod, there was a telescope. And it made me think, if I had been doing all this kind of stuff maybe a couple of hundred years ago, that's probably what my office would look like. As you mentioned, when we got upstairs, we were just blown away by it. All of the, it was effectively like a living museum, for want of a better phrase, like someone had just stepped out and gone out for the milker papers and left everything as it was. But as we were taken round, Ricky was definitely distracted when he got his camera out and started seeing things that he went, ooh, must take a photo. And Ricky went off on his merry way, taking photos of everything he possibly could, whilst Niels walked me around the museum, giving me a bit of a narrated history, narrated tour of Moser himself, what he did when he was younger, how he made his money, all of the other things he did outside of watches. Obviously, we know Moser as a brand now very much for their watches, but Moser himself was a bit of an entrepreneur. He had his fingers in many pies, so to say, and he travelled very widely and predominantly found his little niche travelling along what was known as the Silk Road, so into the areas these days known as China, Russia, etc., where he very much made his money, especially with the old pre-revolution czars of Russia when it came to luxury goods. And this is where he effectively made his fortune and brought it back. And we saw evidence of his travels, things he collected in his travels and how his travels influenced him. We saw lots of materials like uh, Ricky. I think we even saw a mantelpiece clock 
with that Moser movement. And what was that green dial made of? It was actually made of Barbara Plumbo's favourite substance. And that is legal substances we're talking about here because she's only into legal substances. And that is malachite. She told us this was a material that was so difficult to work with and caused so many health issues for those concerned with it back in the day that to see it used so intricately in clocks, in ornaments. It was used in various different things. You'll see some pictures. Again, play along at home. Check the show notes. You will love seeing this because I enjoyed it. And as I say, I didn't expect it. There was all that kind of stuff there. There were original pocket watches. There was a story about the pocket watch that was actually on display. Yep, you're absolutely right. Because part of the history was also about Moser's children and how one of his children decided that watches wasn't really his fortuity in life. So what he did was he went into many other areas of collecting antiquities and trading in antiquities. He collected guns, knives, weapons, tables, bureaus, lights, all sorts of things. But the little story of that pocket watch is later in his life, he was late to a meeting and he asked why he was late. He said that his watch had stopped working or stopped running and he was gifted a pocket watch. And when he got back home and he opened his pocket watch, he found out it was a pocket watch made by his father, Moser, which must have been surely a bit of a laugh and a kick in the teeth simultaneously. So yeah, even having all those things there, along with a multitude of papers, whether it be passports, copies of the will, and all of the historical documentation of Moser and the Greater family. Great to see, really interesting. If you ever get there, you can book yourself a tour to go and see it. I thoroughly recommend it. It's more than watches, it's just a bit of a narrative of its period and its time. There was just tons in there, and we will rattle through it super quick because there's more to get on to, and the museum is a place that if you go across, you need to have a look at. One of the walls, they had all these historic pictures and paintings, and it reminded me of the intro scenes from what they do in the shadows, a TV show. There was another room that had all this architecture stuff, and it had drawings, including drawings of the IWC building that we'd seen the previous day. Out looking from the window, you could see the waterworks and the, the riverside. It was just really great. And then the next room we walked into, there were clocks, there were movements. That was more an assembly room, I suppose. There was a huge, massive in, uh, inner workings of some huge clock that you could actually see everything in life size or larger than life size. And we always look at movements and wonder, how the hell does this actually work? Well, you get to see it in full scale in this room. And then there were letters from people. There were all the tools that you would need, tools of the trade to create watches, to work in watches hundreds of years ago. So absolutely fantastic. Loved every moment of it. I was too busy taking photos and video clips. Dave was kind of getting the tour guide version of things and then he caught me up later on. But we left there and where did we go next, Dave? Then we headed back to the manufacture, home of three of the brands, that being Moser, Hotlands and Precision Engineering. And we got a bit of a quick introduction. We said hello to Edward and a few of the other staff members there before we were whisked off on a another cross-border raid where we were whisked off for lunch and quickly then made our way back to have the tour of the building because most of the watchmakers would be leaving within a few hours. And we went straight into the basement to look at what Precision Engineering are up to. Now, Precision Engineering is as the name would suggest, the engineering wing of the greater group. This is where all those fabulous movements and all the bits under the hood, so to speak, are designed, engineered, as we saw, manufactured and put together. They make up those movements that are powering the Moser and Hotlands watches. Amongst, as we found out, possibly bits of many other brands as well, because precision engineering also do much in the way of engineering, especially with certain parts of movements that many other brands utilise as they have very specific skill sets, as a certain actor would say. I have a very specific set of skills and they very much do indeed. One of those being hairsprings. Now, this is an area that is generally regarded as ultra secret and nobody wants to show anybody anything but the guys at Moser were super open about it. In fact, to the point where we pretty much saw the whole game and other than giving us exact formulations and or temperatures or criteria, we got to see the whole process in action. That involved the raw material, that involved it being drawn, that involved it being flattened, that involved it being treated, wound, heat treated in vacuum furnaces, the whole shooting match. Check out the show notes because there will be a veritable feast of photographs that you will be able to look at that they were quite happy for us to take. So if you want to see what happens behind the scenes when it comes to hairsprings, now's your chance. 
Compared to the IWC tour where we got to see a lot but we were told at every point, don't take photos of this, don't show people's faces, don't take pictures of the machine names, even though anybody that was in the industry could probably pick up on what they were. At Moser, I believe there was twice we were asked not to take any pictures and that was when there was a person involved of winding the hairspring into the collector unit and also when they were working with Vanta Black because they have perfected a technique of working with that material that doesn't f*** it up, which is very difficult. But you're right, precision engineering was brilliant. We got to see the CAD designs on computer screen. We were able to zoom in, zoom out. They don't use SolidWorks. They use a different application for that. But again, completely open and honest with us. And then they had, I thought they were 3D printed replicas of blown up movements, winding mechanisms, but they were even better quality. They were probably used at shows to show off how these things work. Again, great stuff. Hairspring creation, as Dave said, that is something that they do that most people don't. They had a very specific room that is at a very specific temperature and has to remain that way. And it's also bolted to the floor in a way that there's no vibration so that when they create things, it is absolutely perfect. And it's not rods of steel, but it's like steel wire, as you would maybe expect on a welding rig. Obviously, slightly better quality. It comes in as a raw material and then it works its way through different machines using a diamond technique where it's thinned out, it's honed down to extremely tight tolerances. As Dave mentioned, there is this furnace, a vacuum furnace that's used to heat treat things. They've got a water filtration plant in the room that does everything from removing lime scale and impurities to having a UV cannon that just takes out everything from this to give the purest water for the ultrasonic cleaning processes. Incredible to see this all and it reminded me of our trip to Armand Strom but on a much, much bigger scale, taking nothing away from the folks at Armand Strom, but they produce less watches and they have a smaller manufacturer. The, the stuff at Moser, Precision Engineering and Hot Launch was just absolutely incredible. And then we got to ask questions of everybody along the way. Nothing was off bounds, nothing was off the table. And the different people in each of the departments, they're not tour guides, but they, they knew all the information and they were able to translate that to mere mortals and complete idiots like me and Dave. And then we got to move up into the next kind of level where we saw calibration. So where they're taking all of these parts, so the finished or the raw hairsprings that have been manufactured down the stairs, where they go through the classification process. And we saw the two different sides of classification. The more industrial classification area, where they are classifying things in batches that are definitely being shipped out of that building to be utilised by many other well-known brands that unfortunately we are not allowed to name due to confidentiality agreements. We're not allowed to name, but we were told to have a look at uh, what they had and take pictures and then guess if you've seen this component or that component in other watch movements. They do say, they're allowed to say they do the stuff for MBNF, they do stuff for obviously Moser and Hot Launch and there's a couple of things in there like cylindrical hairsprings that I have seen in other watches that don't really get talked about so I have a good understanding that perhaps Moser is producing them. There's definitely many a brand out there of many a high caliber area that are using components that are made in that very factory. In fact, we saw many of them being classified. Then we saw the more artisanal classification area where for many of the high end Moser in-house watches, they were classifying springs on a more one by one basis where they are utilizing these for their own in-house movements. We saw a multitude of machines from Nixie tubes to the more modern computerized variants machines that have been around for decades if not longer and some more modern iterations of it as well. We saw light tables, all sorts of interesting machines and we even got into a bit of a discussion about as they get some new machines, are they going to keep the old ones or are they going to divest them? And the staff seemed quite keen to keep hold of them because, you know, they work well and why get rid of them, keep them as backups. We then after that made our way up to the watchmaking floor where we moved, I guess, more into the world of Moser and there we saw many of the watchmakers involved in the actual manufacture of Moser watches, whether that be T0, T1, T2 processes that we talked about in the last episode. We watched them putting together these works of art and as Ricky mentioned, we even saw some Vanta black dials. We weren't allowed to take pictures, not so much of the dial, but more of um, some of the proprietary techniques that they've developed to allow them to work with a material that is 
extremely difficult to work with and we saw some trays with some very special watches indeed that are almost ready to complete their journey to their end owners shall we say but we saw a multitude everything from streamliner center seconds and pioneers right through to high jewelry tourbillon pieces as well in fact one of the watchmakers went into a box to pull one out to let us have a look at it and hear it in action a fantastic tour of really everything that is Moser Hotelons and Precision Engineering. We stopped off around about five o'clock because Ed had finished all his duties for the day. People were starting to unwind. There was going to be a Christmas party the next couple of days. Everyone was in good high spirits. And we sat down and we had a bit of a drinking session, a very small drinking session with Edward and Nicholas. And this is where part of the tour and part of the, the, the story unfolds that has been kept a little bit quiet. And let me cast your minds back to nearly four years ago, almost four years to the day, where we first spoke to Edward about coming onto the podcast because they were launching an iteration, a new version of the Streamliner Chrono. We'd always loved the brand since we started the show here because their YouTube videos, the fun aspects, the nature watch, when they did the final upgrade, when they've produced the Swiss Icons watch, they've always had fun in the background. But it is such a serious watchmaking business that we're all involved in here. They married the two together. And after we recorded that first show, we kind of threw some ideas around. It'd be cool to make like an April Fool's joke. Maybe we could put the Scottish Watches logo on something. We could have a bit of fun with it. We left it with Ed and we kind of got on with stuff. Then the pandemic hit. But in the background, Ed had been working away with the team. He'd produced a couple of prototype dials and we were going to do something. And then the world closed down, as we all know. Fast forward a couple of years and things have moved on. We're all doing our own kind of thing. And the idea of doing a joke watch kind of was pushed to the side and the moment had passed. But there was still that dial, a couple of prototype dials sitting there. And I'd said to Ed, it'd be good if we could utilise that. Maybe I could get it in a watch because it'd be a shame for it to go to waste. Plus, Scottish watches, the Saltar, you know what we like to do with that. So finally, after nearly four years, I went across with Dave, did the tour, did all the cool stuff. And at the end of the day, finally picked up my Moser Scottish Watches Edition, which you can see if you're watching the YouTube video and you can see if you actually look in the show notes. And this is a variation of the watch that Dave has had for a number of years that I have appreciated and lusted after. So to actually get this little number on the wrist at the end of the year, I think it's a fantastic closeout. And the guys, Edward, the team, Nicholas, everybody that was involved in the process, cannot thank them enough for putting this together because... Last year, I closed out on a high, managed to get a hold of a Snoopy. Again, I was on a waiting list for a couple of years for that one. To get a blue watch at the end of 2023, after all the, the highs and lows, not many lows, but all the highs of the year, including getting engaged and all the crazy trips that we've been on, it was the perfect closeout. And Dave, you are the resident expert when it comes to Moser. Should you want to run us through the tech spec on this? So here we have the... Moser Center Seconds Streamliner 40mm case on there stainless steel you have the integrated bracelet that as you know I have talked about and raved about in fact I love the kind of organic nature of it almost the armadillo-esque feel to the, the bracelet you've been wearing it now a few days obviously there is no micro adjustment in this bracelet but I personally have never had an issue with it whether my wrist has been warm or cold it just kind of works you've got the global light on the hands there so you have these solid blocks of loom that are integrated as part of the hands and they extend beyond the metal part of the hands as the kind of solid loom and at night they glow absolutely vividly. The dial in yours, obviously this is a special dial in a blue coloration as opposed to the two colours that have been made available commercially, that being the green or the kind of matrix green as it's well known or the new salmon colour dial that's out there now in the centre seconds. Other than that, the HMC 200 movement, which is their centre rotor automatic movement, which is the precision engineering Moser movement that runs this watch. You've got the gold rotor on there. So yeah, looking super pretty with that gold rotor on there as well. And obviously, as we've just talked about, all of those components being manufactured in-house, especially things such as the hairspring that we were very privileged to see actually being made. I myself, as we're both wearing Moser jumpers, I myself am wearing the green variant that you can see here now as well. Same watch, but with the green variant. Also in that variant that you're wearing, you have the Moser writing in white. 
the newer variant of the Salmon has the Stealth logo on it as well. So you have the logo still cut into the dial, but not infilled with the material. So yes, uh, I uh, very much believe that the Streamliner is as near to a perfect watch as I have yet to come across in my watch collecting journey. So yeah, very much in love with this watch as a thing. And again, my personal thanks to Edward and all of the team at Moser for the trip, for their kind of generous time that they took spending showing us around and their openness and over the years, everything they've done to, you know, really contribute to the greater world of watches, whether that be with us personally or many other collectors that we know that have had a great experience with them as a brand as well. So there we go. That's the wrist checks incorporated into the final part of our trip. We ended the night on a high, even higher than obviously me picking up my watch. And that was we went for a dinner with Edward, Nicholas and a listener to the show. A guy who actually collects watches, an expat from the UK who now stays over in Switzerland. Tom was across with his wife and we just had a great time. In fact, some of the stories that he told me about his collecting journey, the way things have worked out, even the chats he's had with his good lady, how initially she was like, are you sure you're wanting to buy that watch? That sounds like a holiday to me. Now has transpired that it's completely 180 and his good lady is actually saying, hey, that's a cool watch. I wonder if I could wear that too. Fantastic end to the trip where we went for dinner, as you mentioned, and we got to meet Tom and his wife very much people who are into their watches but we got to talk about a variety of things over and above watches as well and he was super uh, happy to be invited along yeah lovely evening all in all and then not too late at night we managed to retire back to the hotel as i had an early flight the next morning ricky you had a flight slightly later in the day which allowed you a little bit of time to go investigating around the area of zurich i did and we don't have time for me to tell you about the time i had in zurich waiting for my lift to the airport that will have to wait it just remains for me and dave to say have a great festive period thanks for watching and we'll catch you guys again soon